And that, I would say, in one word, is the, the theme for my talk, usefulness. Right? What, what can we do that would be useful for reducing the risks? Uh, this is very uh, 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 personal for me. My background is in engineering. Engineering is all about being useful in various ways. I became interested in global catastrophic risk, go figure, uh, about 10 or 12 years ago when I started studying analytical philosophy. Um, looking at ethics of like, expected value maximization, risk reduction. I'm just going to assume that the people here are familiar with this, me being an engineer. Of course, I express it in terms of calculus. Um, and uh, was exposed to this idea that given this sort of ethics, the uh, risk of extreme catastrophe is, is especially important. Uh, and I thought it made sense to me, and so I've been involved in the topic ever since. Uh, and I will note, as an aside, I, I understand there's some people here who may be uh, more new to these topics uh, and maybe also trying to figure out where best you, you fit in, how you might be able to contribute. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me. I have a very interdisciplinary background. I've been studying this for many years, and perhaps I can be uh, somewhat useful in helping you find a, a way to contribute. Um, but this idea that the extreme risks are especially important, I, we might call this the, the catastrophist claim. The uh, biggest opportunities are for the risk of the highest severity. This is an idea that has been uh, put forth several times over many years, and uh, it's something that I have traditionally believed in myself, though more recently I have found myself questioning whether uh, this is in fact true. Uh, for those of you who are still around tomorrow, I will be uh, leading a discussion uh, that goes into this uh, issue in more detail, but for now I will just give a, a little overview so, so you can have a, a sense for uh, what we're thinking here. So uh, one of the kind of extreme forms, maybe the extreme form of this view comes from Derek Parfit in his uh, 1984 book, Reasons and Persons, where he made the claim that the difference in value between having no one die and 99% of the population die is actually small relative to the difference between 99% and 100%. And the argument was that if it's 100%, then that's not just the deaths of people who are alive at the time, it's all of the future generations that would ever uh, come into existence. And because there could be such a very large number of future generations, therefore, the 100% death scenario is much, much worse than if there are some survivors who can uh, continue on into the future. The problem with this logic, though, is that it ignores what happens to that 1% survivor population. And as we talked about yesterday, we can have um, a number of different types of trajectories for the survivor population. Perhaps it would uh, survive, but with no recovery back up to the sort of large advanced civilization we have now. In which case, yes, there would be uh, a smaller loss of value relative to extinction. I'm pointing to this one right here. But it's not much smaller. They're comparable. Uh, alternatively, even if we do recover, you could have a long-term, uh, 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 you could have a delay in us accomplishing something big by something big, think space colonization, think technological singularity, <coughs> things like that. And even if there is, is just a small delay in that, that could have a long-term effect. So this is just simple uh, exponential growth model, and if you have uh, a slight delay, or alternatively a slightly lower uh, starting point, then uh, you could have a significant long-term effect. And so maybe in this case, even uh, a small change could have a, long, uh, a big long-term effect, which would be comparable to losing 100% of the population. Uh, whether or not this is, is actually true depends on a lot of, of details that I won't get into here. Um, but at least at first glance, it's possible in, uh, that, that smaller catastrophes could have comparable effects. Maybe even the loss of one single person who would have gone on to have children, whose children would have had children, and so on, to so have the long-term loss of a lineage, in which case even very small catastrophes uh, could be uh, comparable. It's still going to be bigger to, to lose more people than to lose fewer people, or more lineages than fewer lineages. 
but you wouldn't be able to point to the long-term effects to say, oh, no, no, this one is much, much bigger than the other one. Uh, so again, we'll, we'll talk about that more tomorrow. For the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on uh, some of the, the catastrophic risks. I'll say a little bit about uh, climate change, a little bit about nuclear war, and a little bit about artificial intelligence. Uh, first, though, I want to introduce uh, two common mistakes that I see people making a lot of time. The first one is, oops, uh, yeah, first one is focusing on the risk itself as opposed to the opportunities to reduce the risk. Just because the risk is large does not mean that our opportunities to reduce that risk are also large. Sometimes they might be, but uh, you have to look at the opportunities to reduce the risk, not the risk itself. Uh, second is looking at solutions that only work in theory. And this is, I think, a pretty common mistake uh, among academics, where we have uh, some idea that, that it makes sense to us, that it works well in our models, but it only works well in our models and our theoretical constructs. And in the actual world for the actual risk, it maybe does not work so well. Uh, these are mistakes that uh, my institute tries to overcome with our uh, research program, which is structured around, we call it, uh, the Integrated Assessment from uh, my institute, the Global Catastrophic Risk Institute. Three main parts, risk analysis, so what, what could go wrong, uh, decision options, what we can do about it, and stakeholder engagement, which is talking with the people who can actually reduce the risk, and it is a uh, two-way dialogue with them. We want them to hear uh, our ideas for how to reduce the risk so they can take it and use them, but we also need to hear from them what their options and constraints and, and so on are so that we can uh, make sure that our analysis uh, matches what can actually be done in practice. And then we evaluate this according to the same uh, risk calculus. So with that in mind, let me uh, tell you a few stories. Let's start with climate change. Uh, this is the, the topic of my uh, PhD dissertation, looking at a debate on uh, the issue of discounting. Uh, discounting is very important for climate change. Climate change is a long-term issue. Discounting is about how we evaluate uh, future costs and benefits, and so how we handle discounting has a big impact on how uh, severe we think climate change is, how big of a problem it is, and likewise how hard we think we should try to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, most of the debate was structured around this one equation called the, the Ramsey equation uh, concerning the discounts rate on consumption as measured in dollars or euros and so on, the discount rate in uh, utility or human welfare, the elasticity parameter which concerns the diminishing marginal utility of consumption, uh, and finally the growth rate on consumption. And there have been two really uh, dominant ways of setting the parameters in this equation. I won't get into the details of them, but the important thing is that uh, they lead to very different recommendations for uh, things like how high we think the carbon tax should be. Those are the names of the approaches, the kind of main proponents for them. Nicholas Stern, who led the Stern Review, he was uh, chief economist of the World Bank. Bill Nordhaus, economist at, at Yale, one of the, the leading environmental economists, had very different views, and they led to fairly different recommendations about uh, how high we think the carbon tax should be. This was a huge debate about 10 years ago, and in fact is still uh, an ongoing debate. Uh, uh, today this is a, a paper in Nature from, from Stern just last year. It also relates to uh, questions of catastrophic risk because how you handle the risk of catastrophic climate change feeds back into the model parameters. But I would say, uh, at least in my own experience, these various debates actually don't really matter. And they don't really matter, at least where I come from in the United States, because we don't have a national carbon tax or anything along the lines of a national carbon tax. So all this debate about how high it theoretically should be is, is actually fairly irrelevant because we don't have any carbon tax. When you see they were debating between how, should it be this high or this high, well, in practice, it's this high, so we can all agree it should go in the same direction, and we, don't, we just don't have the, the policy. And if you look at why uh, the United States does not have this, 
it's not related to discounting or, or economics or, or things like that. It's related to some really dirty politics. We have in the United States uh, this movement, movement conservatism, which just rejects new taxes full stop, doesn't want any, even if you're going to raise tax on carbon and lower tax on, on say, income. So the, you know, the, the slogan from environmental economics, you tax bads, not goods to encourage people to do good things like work and, not, and, and discourage them to do bad things like pollute. Uh, nope, they won't have it. They don't accept any new taxes at all. You have the fossil fuel industry, which, which owns uh, a lot of key politicians, technical terms of regulatory capture, or simply just corruption is a big, big factor in, in American politics. Uh, then uh, for those politicians who do support climate policy, they just haven't won enough elections. And finally, when we did have a lot of uh, politicians who supported climate change policy, especially around 2009, uh, after Obama was elected, it just wasn't high enough on the agenda. So they instead uh, uh, pushed forward legislation on the economy and uh, uh, health care, and ended up not doing anything along the lines of uh, a carbon tax or a cap and trade system or, or anything like that. And when you recognize that these sorts of things are what's holding, at least in the United States back, I can't speak for, for other countries, I don't know the politics of Sweden or, or, or other countries as well. Um, these are the factors that are holding us back. You need solutions that speak to these things, and the discounting debate, it just doesn't show up here. So you need things like, uh, I really like this work by his name's James Quad, he's an uh, economist who uh, it has been developing this concept of economism, which is essentially the rejection of the uh, misuse of economics and public policy, which is, is a really big thing uh, in the United States. Uh, you can have local political action of various sorts. You can try to register voters to, to help win elections. Uh, this Next Gen America group is a group that supports uh, political candidates for office who, who care about climate change and are going to uh, prioritize uh, action on that, and then you even have things that are, are don't don't look and smell at all like climate change, like redistricting reform. We have a big gerrymandering problem in much of the United States, but actually addressing our redistricting problem would lead to, uh, in all likelihood, the election of more people who probably uh, uh, take action on climate change. Um, and so. This is, uh, to me, in climate change, at least in the United States, is, this is where all the action is. It's not the discounting debate, it's not catastrophic risk, it's here. This is where the opportunities are to, to make a big, uh, big impact on climate change. All right, next story, nuclear war. So you probably all, all know about nuclear winter, right? Smoke goes in the atmosphere from burning cities, spreads around the world, blocks sunlight. This is how a nuclear war from anywhere in the world can cause catastrophe across the whole world. And since the early days of nuclear winter research and into today, uh, people who have been involved in the study of nuclear winter have argued that uh, nuclear winter means that we should have massive uh, nuclear disarmament. And the logic makes sense, right? Nuclear winter would be catastrophic, therefore we should have fewer nuclear weapons or maybe even zero nuclear weapons so that we can't have uh, a nuclear winter. And it makes sense, but there is a counter-argument that has been made, which is that this is the essence of deterrence. All right, the people who are responsible for nuclear weapons policy already know that nuclear war would be massively catastrophic. Nuclear winter only changes that from their perspective, kind of just a little bit. I mean, from our perspective, it might really matter, but from their perspective, nuclear war was already so overwhelmingly catastrophic that the only conclusion is that a nuclear war must never be fought. Therefore, the only purpose of nuclear weapons is for deterrence, and we need to make sure that deterrence works, so that we don't, we don't have war. That's, uh, that's the kind of dominant way of thinking among you know, the, the countries that have nuclear weapons. And nuclear winter doesn't really change all of that. So you know, we learn more about it. Maybe us in this room become more worried about nuclear war. Uh, but nuclear winter, in this regard, doesn't really change things all that much. Maybe there's some people for whom uh, nuclear winter changes their thoughts a little bit, but for the most part, hasn't really changed things. Even the nuclear weapons insiders 
will often uh, go off in directions that I feel like don't change things. This is a report from a few years back, a trilateral US, Russia, Germany, group of nuclear weapons experts. These are the insiders. These are the people involved in the policy communities. The big mistake that I see them making is that they focus too much on weapon systems, missile defense, precision weapons, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and I see that, I'll explain why in a second. I don't see that as really having a big effect on the, uh, the overall risk. And finally, we have the, the new thing, this uh, treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, the, the so-called nuclear ban treaty just came out earlier this year. And uh, it's, uh, it's been celebrated by, by many people. It was uh, about you know, uh, eight or 10 years of effort to make this happen. Uh, some people are really excited about it. I'm actually kind of indifferent because I don't see this really uh, uh, moving things one way or another among the countries that have nuclear weapons. The countries that have signed this large number of countries, none of them have nuclear weapons, and for the most part are not even in military alliances with the countries that do have nuclear weapons, for, for the most part. So I don't think this matters, at least it doesn't matter much. So what does matter with nuclear weapons? Well. If you look at the distribution of nuclear weapons around the world and think about what it is that motivates these countries to have nuclear weapons in the first place and to potentially even consider using them uh, in a conflict, uh, then some more uh, uh, useful insights start to emerge. Of all of these countries, the ones that I think matter are Russia, uh, Israel, Pakistan, and North Korea because these are the countries that have a relatively precarious geopolitical position. And in comparison, the United States, we kind of don't really need our nuclear weapons, and I think we sort of know this too. We have uh, the most powerful conventional military, we have a borders with Canada, Mexico, and the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, a pretty safe place in the world to, to sit, um, and we have by far the, the largest network of, of allies around the world. Uh, in contrast, Russia has borders with a lot of countries that it doesn't get along with very well, uh, and it has a much smaller conventional military, a smaller economy, smaller population. The one thing that's really keeping it secure is its nuclear weapons, right? We're not gonna invade Russia because it has 7,000 nuclear weapons, so that would be that would be suicide. That would that would be a big mistake. Israel Israel's conventional military by now has gotten to the point where maybe they don't need uh, uh, nuclear weapons relative to their neighboring adversaries. Pakistan has India, which is much bigger, and so that's a strong motivation for Pakistan to keep its nuclear weapons. And North Korea, same story, been in the news over the last couple of weeks. Uh, same same sort of logic applies there. But Russia is the big one. If you can get Russia to feel comfortable with its geopolitical position, um, then you can get a lot of nuclear disarmament and a lot of overall reduction in the risk. Uh, and so how do you go about doing that? Well, there are two big things that are holding us back. The, big, the first big thing used to be uh, the Ukraine crisis, which just destroyed any hope of further disarmament between the United States and Russia. And then uh, we have last year's uh, uh, United States election, which Russia, as far as we can tell, uh, had a uh, very controversial uh, involvement in and led to the election of uh, a new American president who is really just not very good at international diplomacy. I think it's the polite way of putting it. Um, until we resolve this, or at least get it far enough behind us that we can kind of move on, I don't think we're going to have any significant progress in nuclear disarmament, and we're going to have to live with a, a pretty high risk of nuclear war. So we need to address these issues in the near term, and then over the long term, we need to help uh, Russia figure out a, what its place in the world is, and in a way that we all are comfortable with. Um, so that, I think, is a big challenge. But there's other, other things, like in uh, the United States, if we were to have another uh, uh, bilateral agreement with Russia on nuclear disarmament right now, I don't think it would pass the Senate. In the Senate, you need 67 out of 100 votes. This is how it was in 2010. It 
it, it passed, but only by a few votes. And the uh, makeup of the Senate is different now. By my count, if it was to happen right now, um, then it would fail. It wouldn't have the votes. It would have more than 50 votes. Uh, but I think we would have probably around 55. We need 67. I don't think it would pass. Now, incidentally, the, um, the, the politicians that you would need in the Senate to get new start, uh, a, a new, new start treaty or a, a disarmament treaty are the same sorts of politicians that you also need, for the most part, uh, for climate change policy. So we don't even have to worry which is more important, climate change and nuclear weapons. You need to elect the same people in both cases. Uh, so we don't actually have to worry about which risk is bigger. Um, and so this is to, to the previous point. We don't need to focus on the risk itself, just what are the opportunities to reduce the risk. Um, so that's nuclear weapons. Last one, artificial intelligence. This one to me is a lot more opaque. It's a, a more new issue. We don't have as much experience with it. Uh, we, don't, we don't know how it works quite as well. Uh, some of the work that's going on, there's a lot of work right now on uh, technol technical aspects of AI safety. And I think this is good. I do think this is helpful. This is analogous to uh, like engineering research on how to make solar power and wind power more energy efficient. Um, and, and this is uh, uh, good work. It's helpful uh, as long as you can get the, uh, the designs put into place. Um, but having the designs, of course, is a prerequisite for making that happen. Then you have some legal and policy ideas. Uh, these, again, you, you, maybe they would work in, in theory, but you need to figure out how to make it all happen. Uh, and this holds both for the, the technical aspects and the legal and policy ideas. Um, I'm still thinking the AI issue through. I think probably we all are. But the big dynamic that just jumps out at me as being possibly the most important aspect of it is uh, what we might call uh, application R&D synergy for AGI, artificial general intelligence, the, the big uh, potentially uh, transformative type of AI. Uh, we don't need to get too hung up on the term general intelligence. Uh, yesterday we heard the term super powerful intelligence. I think, I think that's also a pretty good term. But any circumstance in which the long-term uh, R&D towards that type of AI has valuable near-term applications, whether it's valuable uh, in, in a market setting, you can make a lot of money from it, like what we're seeing right now with a lot of the machine learning, or it's valuable for military applications, or for, for something else that people really care about. Um, the reason this matters is because when you have that synergy, then if you want to uh, regulate, whether publicly or privately, if you want to try to influence, try to steer, uh, try to improve outcomes for the, the future uh, AI, you now need to manage this massive uh, uh, interest in the near-term R&D, right? So just imagine trying to uh, say, you know what, we need to stop having deep learning right now, right? Like, that's a tough thing to do because it's just so deeply entrenched and there's so much money uh, and, and so much demand for it uh, right now. Uh, so will we get uh, a general intelligence or super powerful AI from uh, work that is of near-term value or does it require a really dedicated effort that fewer people are going to want to do and are going to need resources to do, which gives you uh, uh, opportunities to intervene and try and steer it in, in different directions. This, to me, is really the, the big question that stands out for, for AI. In a way, it's like asking whether AI risk is more like nuclear weapons, where you only have a few actors, only nine countries have nuclear weapons. You can look at them on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, and, and they really have to go out of their way to, to have nuclear weapons, which makes the, the governance, I think, uh, in, in many respects, easier, or is it more like fossil fuels, where many, I mean, each of us every day uses fossil fuels just by going about our day, um, and, and in which case you would need some sort of mass public governance along the lines of a, a carbon tax or, or something like that. Uh, now, nuclear weapons is hard because these are uh, the weapons at the heart of uh, some countries' uh, national security strategies. AI could potentially actually be easier than that if it's coming from, say, academic research labs 
that are doing it because they think it's a fascinating research problem, um, that should be a much easier governance problem. But this, to me, really jumps out as, as the big factor in AI that should guide our overall strategy for, for AI risk reduction. Um, to summarize all of this, essentially what I'm proposing is, we might call it a scavenger hunt model for, for risk reduction, where you start with, you might even start with basic ideas about risk and the, the value of future generations and so on, and then you look at specific risks and, and fairly narrow disciplinary terms, and then you gradually build in more factors related to risk management and policy. It becomes a more interdisciplinary conversation. But pretty soon you need to step outside of academia and look at the world as it actually exists, the risks and the dynamics that will affect them in the world, and so on and so on, one step after another, until finally you end up with the personal circumstance, because each of us is going to have different opportunities to reduce the risk. I am American. I, I uh, am with a, a nonprofit risk institute. I live in New York City, for example. Those uh, offer me certain types of opportunities that maybe you don't have, but you have other opportunities. And by uh, going through step by step, uh, through that whole process, I would say that is how each of us is going to find the best opportunities to reduce the risk. And I'll stop there. Thank you. But it's certainly the case that the, the Obama administration uh, did do any number of things in order to uh, try to help out on climate change. We didn't have a sort of sweeping carbon tax that could affect the, the whole U.S. economy and, and pushing in the right direction. But, but there were some things. That, you know, this just goes back to the point that, that elections matter because those things that Obama did, we're not getting them right now. certainly uh, many uh, important open research questions on many different aspects of the risk. Uh, I don't want to completely dismiss the value of, of academic work in this area. Uh, that's, that's certainly not the case. What I do think, though, is that uh, what academic work is done should be very focused on uh, the real-world dynamics of, of the risks and, and where the, the actual opportunities are. Uh, it's quite easy for us to get caught up in fairly uh, uh, intellectual debates on different aspects of it while, meanwhile, the world goes off and does something else. So concretely, concretely what? How would you like to see that happen? Uh, I, I can't speak because uh, I don't know everyone's personal circumstances. So. Yeah, if you compare the two, uh, three examples, uh, there is this difference that you uh, can reduce risk at early R&D stages, let's say in the AI case, rather than late ones when you have the products out and the, the risk is in. So there is a, a difference there. Could you develop a little bit of your thoughts how to uh, reduce risks at early R&D stages, where you aim at researchers rather than a, in a politicians? So in the uh, research literature on the governance of emerging technology, there is a, a concept, I believe it is called the Collingridge Dilemma, if I, if I recall correctly, 
where it is that uh, for an emerging technology, when the technology is relatively new, and maybe early stages of R&D, it is in some respects easier to govern because it has not become entrenched. Uh, it's not you know, dispersed widely across society, across the economy. Uh, you don't have uh, uh, wealthy institutions that are pushing policy in one direction or another, uh, things of that sort. Yet on the other hand, it's harder to uh, govern successfully because it's so uncertain. And that's a, a big challenge uh, with, uh, with all technology. We don't, when it's an early R&D, we don't know fully what the risks are and how we would like to, to regulate that. We see this certainly with AI right now, where a lot of the conversations that I'm involved in among people who are deeply worried about risks from AI, they're actually very nervous about public policy in it because they're worried about locking in the wrong regulations. Um, the, it's not all of the AI that we want to get rid of, because we clearly AI can be useful for many things. Um, and so it, it really requires a, a, a subtle uh, approach to get uh, uh, governance, whether it's through government or, or private governance efforts, that is uh, sufficiently early and uh, uh, sufficiently uh, attuned to what the actual risks are. Um, and so I think, uh, there is a lot of value in trying to learn uh, early and often what aspects of uh, any given technology we think are, are most concerning. And so uh, for this, in, in the context of AI, for example, but I would anticipate the same would apply with biotechnology uh, and other emerging technologies, the more that we can do to tease out the directions that the technology is going kind of in real time or even anticipating to some extent, uh, the more successful we can be with the government. Uh, I, I share your, your view that there have been too much discussions on, on the discounting issues with respect to climate change. Uh, yet I will not agree that it's such a almost unimportant gift, or, uh, despite the fact that all the world countries are facing the zero carbon tax on, on, on Earth. But, but I think uh, these numbers have nevertheless been used in the policy debate. For example, quite a lot of the discussion has been referred to uh, previously on our numbers based on Nordhaus saying that, okay, given these estimates from leading experts in the world, it seems that climate change is a problem, but it's not really that big of a problem, a big problem to deal with. And hence, the development by Stern and others in, in that respect, I think, was quite important in order to show that given what, at least I think, are more sensible assumptions, we've come up with these problems are really huge or, or also from that perspective. But, but given that, I, I share that this is, this is not the major of course, path forward we should focus on, but, but I think it's, it, it's, it's still important to, to uh, uh, from that perspective. So, so I can speak mostly in the, the US context. I understand that the climate change debate might be uh, somewhat different in the U.S. than it is in, in many other countries because the U.S. has uh, such a, a strong attention to the lingering idea that my, climate change might not be a problem at all, might, or might not even, even be happening, remains to this day a, a major uh, force within the American climate change debate. Um, I believe I have seen some people who would argue against uh, climate change being a problem uh, cite uh, uh, Nordhaus and other economists saying that, uh, that climate change doesn't seem that bad. And my recollection is that Nordhaus and colleagues have gotten upset at their words being used in this way because uh, they firmly believe that climate change is a problem and that we uh, should be taking action to reduce emissions. They just don't think that the uh, extent of the action is as large as, as Starting and others think it to be. Um, but regardless, I would say uh, here then we need one more step uh, uh, in addition to the discounting debate, which is an attention to uh, the, the, the policy debate, the rhetoric that's being used, and how that influences the policy that, that gets uh, passed or doesn't get passed. Um, and so there we need to be not just looking at the arguments for and against different discounting parameters, we need to be looking at the, the policy rhetoric and the dynamics of that.
as that would be the next step in our little scavenger hunt. Um, so you want to find a number of sort of clear, actionable um, alternative approaches towards um, as you refer to about climate, you could also think about um, uh, gender gerrymandering, you could sort of about um, nuclear proliferation rather than trying to go through uh, UN and work with countries that are needing sort of some non nuclear weapon states are in that process. You could look at um, uh, reassuring Russia, but then there's also a concern that in, in some of those cases you get involved in very highly politicized processes as well that have longer term uh, unexpected consequences. In the case of Russia, actually the the steps that could reassure Russia enough to make a meaningful difference there could also provide a sort of incentive for proliferation where other countries are like, well, if you are in a precarious situation uh, and you have a large enough arsenal, uh, we will take steps to sort of reassure your, uh, you and your strategic situation uh, as long as you have nuclear weapons. Uh, so if I, if I understand your point correctly, you're saying that uh, we should be cautious about making Russia too comfortable because that could well, have uh, uh, problematic side effects. Well, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. In general, there's, there's, if you get involved in those political issues as well, there could be downstream side effects that you yeah. know, So I, I, I feel tempted to take the opportunity to be as, as harshly critical of Russia as I can with my, my best Russian friends sitting sitting in the fourth row. But no, you can uh, <laughs> not support the Russian <laughs> No, um, I I agree. I mean, most generally, we should we should consider all of the, the relevant factors. And in international relations, there are always lots of relevant factors. Um, but I, I still believe if we can find uh, a place in the world for Russia that it is comfortable with, such that that it is not just you know not threatening to the United States, but also not threatening to to Finland and to, to uh, 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 Ukraine and, and Estonia and, and, and other countries, and then that should really work out to everyone's advantage. And actually a big, I, I think, under, underappreciated side effect of this is that then we get Russia's, we potentially could get Russia's cooperation on this whole host of other things. And one thing I really like about Russia, perhaps it shares with US, the UK, and Sweden, is that Russia has a really a, a strong sense of, of uh, international leadership. It sees itself as uh, an independent major power, and that on its own, I really like. I like that, that Russia you know, doesn't want to just you know, play in the shadows, that it, it wants to be out there on the world stage trying to make a difference, and you know, it's just a question of whether it's making a positive difference or not. But I, I would really like to believe that we can uh, uh, find a way for Russia to be making a positive difference in the world because I think it's got quite a lot of capacity, quite a lot of potential to do so. And I know that is a complete failure of my attempt to harshly criticize Russia. Um, but but that's, that's, that's how I see it. That's, that's where I think we should try to get to. Uh, you're welcome to completely disagree with everything I just said. Yeah, I think that we need some internal challenges inside Russia to return our focus to West because now our, our government took uh, the way of self-isolation and uh, fighting with everybody and it is uh, <coughs> dead end way from my point of view, but I think it is possible to return to the exit and start collaboration with other countries. In, in that case, Russia is able to contribute to global citizens. Sounds good to me. <laughs> Let's thank Seth.